All right, good morning, most excellent sailors. It's good to be with you again. Today we are going to build on the awesome work that you guys have been doing with word choice. We are gonna move into the trait of ideas. And ideas will use word choice, fireball nouns, precise and proper nouns, really excellent vivid adjectives, but then to put them into sen sentences that move into vivid description. So today's learning target is this. I can use vivid detail or ideas to show the reader versus just telling the reader. And all year we're gonna come back to that. How do we show versus tell? If you're bored while you're writing, I can guarantee you we are bored reading it. How can we make your writing pop and come to life? So that's today's magic and lesson that we're gonna teach you. And then we're gonna end, end the lesson with something a little bit sexy, something that isn't quite taught until high school, and it is called the appositive. The appositive is a really cool sentence structure, and it will make your writing sound more sophisticated and more interesting. And it has to do with a noun and then a noun phrase. So that will be coming at you at the end of today's lesson. Showing versus telling and the appositive. Your document that you need open today is our writer's notebook. And so you may pause the video teachers and go ahead and pull up your writer's notebook. Meet you back in a sec. All right, yesterday's work in our writer's notebook, you were, um, you were describing the hottest place on earth and using you know, awesome power verbs and you know, blistering hot adjectives to make it sizzle. Um, today, we're going to just scroll up and you'll find this, ideas, okay? All about ideas. We're going to do a little warm-up today, and you're going to have a boring, bland, rice cake, very dry type of sentence, and there's a noun there, and the noun is bolded and it's underlined, and you're going to replace that noun with something very specific, precise, and interesting. You do not need to rewrite the sentence or alter it. We just want you right next to the sentence to replace that boring noun and come up with something that pops and something that sizzles. So here we go. Number one, our vacation to that spot was amazing. So where did you go? Come on, are you talking about the Grand Canyon? Are you talking about um, Atlantis Paradise Beach Resort in the Bahamas? Where is the specific spot? Maybe you're thinking of an actual hotel or resort in an actual city in a tropical location. So you're gonna go ahead and put something right there. Okay, so I might say mm, the Iroquois Hotel on Mackinac Island. So that's a lot more specific. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run through all the items and then teachers, you may pause the video and you guys can get to work. Okay, number two, our pet was like a member of the family. So I don't see the pet. Are we talking about like a you know, a Bernadoodle named Bruce. What do you got? A Komodo dragon. What's your pet? So next, number two, you'll put something there. Three, the present was exactly what I wanted. I want specifics. I want to know what's the brand name, the make, the model, all the goods. The weather was bad. Are we talking about a torrential hailstorm? Are we talking about a specific name of a hurricane that's wreaking havoc on the coastline? And number five, instead of um, a noun for this one, you're going to use a verb. I went toward the bus. What are you doing? Are you darting? Are you hurtling yourself? Are you sprinting? And lastly, the stadium was big, right? Colossal, gigantic, okay? Go ahead and replace the fire, the rice cake word choices with something that is hot and fiery and interesting, okay? I'll have you pause the video and go for it. All right. Welcome back. Um, hopefully you came up with some awesome and more specific word choices there. That's what we're all about this week. And using that, hanging on to that idea of instead of the went, you're talking about hurtling or driving or darting. We're going to take word choice and we're going to build it into an idea. So what are ideas in writing? When we talk about the trade of ideas, we mean this. We mean all of the main part, but also all of the supporting details, the heart of your message, but all of the little pieces that help paint the picture in the reader's mind. Great writers, they don't just tell the reader, but they show the reader. 
So in your notes right there in your writer's notebook, I want you to write what I have here in bold. Ideas. What it means is to show the reader. Do not just tell the reader. Showing versus telling. Go ahead and jot that down in your notes. All right, so we're showing versus telling the reader. In my classroom, I have a big banner in my back wall, and I refer to it all through the year. And it's a quote from writer Anton Chekhov. Don't tell me the moon is shining. Show me the glint of light on broken glass. Don't tell me. Show me. Make me see it. Make me feel it. Make me taste it. Make me hear it. Take me there. Show me. Don't tell me. So we got to go and look to the pros. How do great authors do this in their work? Okay, so below, scrolling along on your document, your writer's notebook, you have an invitation to notice. I'm going to read to you, and I want you to figure out what, what are some of the ideas, the nouns, the details that really bring this passage to life? What do you see? What did your picture help you understand about the story or this setting? Okay. Today when I read, um, I'm reading a piece, it's a true story, it's a memoir by George Howe Colt and it's called The Big House. And I really like this piece because um, it makes me feel like I'm there right away from the opening page. So this writer, he's writing about um, a summer house that's been in his family for many years. It's out on uh, Cape Cod and it's been there for generations, but nobody in the family can afford to maintain it, um, so they have to sell it. And there's been so many amazing celebrations there, graduation parties, there's been weddings, family reunions. And the writer, he's been vacationing there since he was a kid. He's brought his own kids there. And now he has to come and say goodbye. But he doesn't come in summer to say goodbye. He has to come in the middle of winter. So if you ever have been to a cottage, a vacation home, um, a cabin, something that is a place that you go to enjoy recreational time and leisure time and fun, what might it be like to kind of trespass in it, to visit it, like in the middle of winter, after it's been kind of asleep and dormant and laying closed for months? What would you see? What would you feel? What would you experience? So I think the writer here is trying to convey an idea of like kind of like loneliness and sadness and saying goodbye. So as I read, I want you to jot in your writer's notebook. What do you notice great things our writer is doing. So showing versus telling, and right here, what ideas strike you as I read, okay? The doors that are always open have now been closed and locked. The windows are shut tight. The shades are drawn. No water runs from the faucets. The toaster, which in the best of times works only if its handle is pinned under the weight of a second and even less functional toaster, is unplugged. The kitchen cupboards are empty except for a stack of napkins, a box of sugar cubes, and eight cans of beer. The porch furniture, six white plastic chairs, two green wooden tables, has been stacked in the living room. The croquet set, the badminton equipment, the tennis net, and the flag are now all behind closet doors. The dinghy is turtled on sawhorses in the barn, the oars angled against the wall. And that roasted salt scent of August has now given way to the stale smell of mothballs, ashes, and mildew. But here and there, there are traces of last summer, a striped beach towel tossed on the washing machine, a half-empty shampoo bottle wedged in the wooden slats of the outdoor shower, a fishing lure on the living room man mantel, a half-burned log in the fireplace, a sprinkling of sand behind the kitchen door. Dead hornets litter the window sills. A drowned mouse floats in the lower bedroom toilet. The most recent entry in the guest book was made five months ago. The top newspaper in the kindling pile is dated September 29th. The ship's clock in the front hall has stopped at 2.45, but whether that's a.m. or p.m., no one can tell. After gorging and feasting on summer for three months, this house has gone into hibernation. They call it the off season, as if there were a switch in the cellar next to the circuit breakers that one flipped to plunge the house from brimming to empty, warm to cold, 
Noisy to silent, light to dark. Outside, too, the world has changed color from blue and yellow and green now to gray and brown. The tingle of honeysuckle and, and roses and poison ivy that lapped up at the porch is now just a skein of bare branches and vine. The lawn is hard as tundra, brown as burlap. The Benedict's house next door, hidden from view when I was last here, is visible through the leafless trees. And the woods give up their secrets. Old tennis balls are now found. An errant frisbee, a lost tube of sunblock, a badminton birdie. And out in the bay, the water's the color of steel. And spattered with white caps, without the presence of boats to lend perspective, the waves look ominously large. On the stony beach, the boardwalk, a set of narrow planks we used to enter the water without spraining our ankles on the algae slick rocks has now been piled above the tide line, beyond the reach, we hope, of storms. A summer house in winter, it is a forlorn, sad thing. In its proper season, every door is unlocked, every window wide open, and people too are more open in summer, moving through the house and each other's lives as freely as the wind. Their schools, their offices are far and distant, their guard is down, their feet are bare, they soak up the sun. Now as I walk from room to room, shivering in my coat, I have the feeling that I am trespassing, as if I've snuck into the museum at night. And without people to fill it, this house takes on a life of its own. Family photographs seem to breathe, their subjects vivid and laughing are now suspended at the most beautiful moments of their youth. All right, and I'm going to pause there. Go ahead and write down what were some of the things you could really see from what I read. And you went into this old summer house that they have to sell and it's been all closed up. What could you see? Okay, you can pause the video and just discuss around your crew. Okay, what I always see is I always see like the dead hornets littering on the windowsill. Um, and things left behind that are reminders of, of the beauty and the life of summer, like a striped uh, beach towel laying out there, um, like a squeezed half empty bottle of, of sunblock. And then all of a sudden in winter, you find things that are lost like tennis balls, right? I, he had so many nouns, so many things, so many details in this house, all of the stuff that it really brought it to life for me. He didn't have to tell me that he felt sad or that he felt alone, or that this house was once really just filled with memories and now it's just sort of like shadows and almost like a death in a sense. But he showed me. He showed me through the dead hornets, the dead mouse, all of the things forgotten, all the stuff used by people, but are, have now just been left. So I found that to be a really powerful example of great writing, of showing versus telling. Okay. We're going to look at another example. This is very different. Description of insects, insect stings. I got stung a couple uh, times this summer. Who's been stung recently or stung before? And the author here describes um, the pain from ranging from caustic to blinding. So here is Schmidt's sting, sting pain index. And what might it feel like to be stung by a honey wasp? Notice the fireball word choices. Spicy, blistering, a cotton swab dipped in habanero sauce has been pushed up your nose. <sighs> okay, yeah, feels good. Um, let's see, a ferocious polybia wasp. It's like a trick gone wrong. Your posterior is a target for a BB gun. Bullseye over and over and over. Because there's gonna be a time this year when you write about um, when you took a risk. And sometimes our wrists, they end in pain or injury, but not all pain is the same, right? Like sometimes it's throbbing. Sometimes it's just this boom, this shemp, this intense, sharp, um, stabbing feeling, and then it just sort of radiates outward, right? You want to capture that in your writing. Okay. What is it like to get stung by a Western honeybee? Burning, corrosive, but you can handle it. A flaming match head lands on your arm and is quenched first with lye and then sulfuric acid. <sighs> A warrior wasp, torture. You are chained in the chained in the flow of an active volcano. Um, what else? What does a red fire ant feel like? Sharp, sudden, mildly alarming, like walking across a shade carpet and reaching for the light switch. Right? Very cool. Um, 
So I just want to share a little bit here. Um, one more. A tarantula hawk, blinding, fierce, shockingly electric. A running hairdryer has been dropped into your bubble bath. A bolt out of the heavens. Lie down and just scream. All right, so it's your turn. You've seen several examples now. One is a feeling of feeling um, forlorn, sad, a sense of loss, closure with the, with the summer house. And the second one was pain. And both writers, they didn't just tell us, but they showed us. Here you go. In your writer's notebook, you're going to put your cursor right here under, under number one. You're going to show us, don't tell us. The first one is Jimmy is scared. All right, here we go. Jimmy is scared. All right, well, what does scared look like? Think about it. You can't just say Jimmy is scared. Oh, I know, Mrs. P. Jimmy, Jimmy is terrified. All you did is change one word, but you didn't show me anything. What does fear look like? So I'm going to have your teacher pause the video, and I want you to capture at least three to three, at least three strong details. What are somebody's eyes doing? What are their hands doing? What is their face doing? What are their jaw doing, right? Does he have, you know, his jeans are turning dark because he's got tinkle potty running down his leg. Oh, Jimmy's scared, okay? Pause and write. See you in a sec. All right. Jimmy is scared. Hopefully you came up with things like Jimmy's face grew pale. His eyes widen into white saucers as they dart around nervously. With hands trembling, knees knocking, he crept cautiously across the room, right? Is he sucking on his thumb in the fetal position? Right. Was he clutching something? Um, what does fear look like? I love it. Show me, don't tell me. All right, the next one, very different emotion. And this one is anger. When you enter the classroom every day, you kind of try to gauge your, your teachers, the barometer of his or her mood, right? What's, what's kind of the tone for the hour? How are they going to roll today? And uh, you walk in and you see Mrs. Bixby. We knew the teacher was angry with our class, okay? What does anger look like, right? Does she just like grab the handle of the door and unleash it off its hinges as she bursts in. You can hear her high heels clicking, right? Is her jaw set, devil horns. All right, I'll, I'll quit stealing your thunder. I'll shut up. All right, pause the video. And I want at least, I'm going to stretch it this time, five details to show anger. What does anger look like, sound like, and feel like? Go for it. All right, so if you haven't yet, teachers, you can go ahead and pause the video again and have students in the crew share out either one. Um, Jimmy's scared, the teacher was angry. We're looking for show versus tell detail, things that are vivid, that describe anything going on with the face, the body, movement, gritted teeth, all of that. Show me anger. Okay, so our learning target we wanted to learn about how do we bring life to our writing? Well, we show the reader, we don't tell them. We don't say, oh, the moon is shining. Oh, Jimmy is scared. We use details. And the last thing I wanna give you today is a type of sentence that helps do that. This sentence uses all the things we've already learned, fireball word choices, precise and powerful nouns, and it also is gonna change up your the flow of your sentence. It's gonna be a little bit more of a complicated and a little bit more interesting sentence. And it's called the appositive. So you gotta write about something. You start with a noun, a person, place, or thing. All right, I'm gonna say my cat, all right? So my cat, and I'm gonna use a noun phrase to describe my cat before I move on to say what it even does. My cat, my cat, a furry tank, stole my Lee's chicken drumstick. Okay, so you can see I have a cat here and then a furry tank. He stole my Lee's chicken drumstick. So it's a noun. Tank is also a noun. It just simply follows it. It adds a little bit more specificity, a little bit more interest, a little bit more detail to your subject. Well, what's your cat look like? It's a furry tank, okay? Next one. Mr. Krabs, a cheap penny-pinching dictator, hides his secret pet crabby formula from all. My mom, a prison warden, took my iPhone, and I can't call him anyone. Um, 
my kids, Satan's little helpers, right? Um, ate all my favorite Rice Krispie treats from the pantry. Okay, so you have a noun and a noun phrase after it. We're going to be working with the positive this year. You're going to we'll hold your feet to the fire and you're going to have to use it in some pieces of writing. So try one out right here. Create your own. It can be about a pet, a friend, a family member. Go for it. Boom. Okay. Teachers, you may pause and allow students to create their own positive. All right, I'm going to put one in. All right, so I came up with my locker, a toxic wasteland devours my overdue library book. So you have a noun, a noun phrase, and then the rest of the sentence, like you normally would. You normally just say, yeah, my locker, it devours all my, my library books. Oh, my mom, she took my phone. But all you're doing is adding another phrase to qualify that. My mom, a prison warden, my locker, a wasteland, okay? Last thing, to get out of English class today. We wanna see your work and how you're doing with the positive. So we're gonna ask that you come up with one. It's posted in a Google question today. So you're just gonna go to your English teacher's Google Classroom page and there's a question waiting for you, post your positive sentence. Now, when you post this one, you're gonna actually put the proper commas, the commas in the right place. My cat, comma, a furry tank, comma, stole my Lee's chicken drumstick, boom, okay? J.K. Rowling, comma, author of Harry Potter, comma, is one of the richest women in the world, period, All right? My first hour, comma, a class of geniuses, comma, delights me daily. Okay, you get the idea. So a noun, a comma, your little noun phrase, another comma, and finish the sentence. Okay, I want this a positive to be a new one, different from the one you created in your writer's notebook. So that ends our lesson today. We're going to be looking over your positives to make sure you've got it. And we're going to continue this work tomorrow. But remember, good writers, they show versus tell the readers. And on a positive is a cool way to add some of that show versus tell uh, description in your work. All right. Good luck with your positive today, sailors, and have an awesome rest of your day.